welcome back everyone it's up to go we are back with our weekly Jujutsu Kaisen content due to popular demands. Some of you guys are confused on what's going on. Actually, let's be honest, 90% of you guys are confused with the whole cutting games. But don't worry, that's why we are here and we are so excited to explain the greatness of Jujutsu Kaisen. And the recent chapters have been bangers after bangers, with the last few primarily on Yuta's return. Satoru Gojo's strongest student, which Volume 0 heavily focused on. Recently, we posted a video discussing his entire story, and Ardo even went into the role Yuto plays in the culling games. As Yuto must kill Kenjaku to help achieve Gojo's dream of changing the society and the Jujutsu world for the better. We highly recommend you guys watch this video if you want to understand Jujutsu Kaisen. Okay, so chapter 177 and 176 made big revelations about a new clan that is linked to Sukuna, Tengen, and Kenjaku. But to understand the implication of this review, we must do a quick breakdown of what's happening in the culling games. Currently from our gang, Itadori, Megumi, Hakari, Panda and Yuta have entered the culling game. Megumi and Itadori pretty much sorted out what they needed to do in the Tokyo Colony number 1 section. The goal was to ask the highest point earner to make a new rule of point transfer between players without the need of killing. This was so that players that like Megumi's sister, Sumiki, could survive in the game without needing to kill anyone. Remember guys, if a player's points don't update within 19 days, they will undergo curse technique removal, effectively killing them. So this new rule they want to make will counter the rule that pretty much kills you if you just don't play the game. Itadori actually succeeded in this goal to make a rule for point transfer after his fight with Hiromi Higuruma, who was then convinced to follow through and make this new rule. Megumi after defeating Reggie Star, a curse user from the past ends up falling due to fatigue. But coincidentally, he is found by Angel Hana Kurusu, who is another player from the past the gang needed to meet. Hana, according to Tengen, has a curse technique that can extinguish any other curse techniques and is able to open up the back of the prison realm that Gojo is sealed in. So pretty much two objectives were completed by our favorite duo. Hakari and Panda's status is yet to be updated but they are in the second Tokyo colony. Their goals were similar to the other two of finding the highest point earner and getting them to cooperate in making a rule for our gang. However, by the looks of things, unlike in Tokyo 1 with Higuruma, Tokyo 2, the highest point earner is a cursed user from the past, Hajime Kashimo. It's very possible that Hakari and Panda might have to 2v1 this dude. But this moves us on to the current chapters with Yuta, who is in the Sendai colony. Colony. Last we saw, our boy Yuta absolutely destroyed two of the strongest players of the Sendai colony, Dhruv Lakdawala and a special grade curse spirit called Kurochi. I butchered that guy's name. Listen, it's not even a guy, it's a freaking cockroach or something, I don't know what it is. Yuta actually used Rika to save a few civilians from the attack of these players like the best boy he is and went on to handle the problem himself. But he now has bigger problems to worry about, which are Ryu, Kishigori and a player who believes he has the highest curse energy output in the entire game. And Takako Uro, a very unreserved player with the ability to use the sky as a surface. They both showed amazing observation skills when they noticed that our boy Yuta has bottomless energy and also noted that Yuta can use reverse curse technique as is shown in chapter 176. And now in chapter 177, Yuta is balls deep in a face off with these two overwhelming players. First, he was faced by Takako who, like Ryu, is a cursed user from the past wishing for a second chance at life, hence taking Kenjaku up on his offer. Initially, Yuta tried to understand why she killed people and what is the point of living forever if you are living your life in this way. In Yuta's perspective, this is simply desperate selfishness. Obviously, his hero mindset pissed her off and she starts remembering how she was looked down upon and like given a similar lecture by a man from the Fujiwara clan, likely their leader. So she asks Yuta if he is one of the Fujiwaras. 
Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, who the frick are the Fujiwaras? Huh? What's going on, Anime Balls Deep? Uh, listen, guys, I'll explain it. Gege Octomi takes a lot of inspiration from the real world in regards to some of the concept in Jujutsu Kaisen. And if you guys didn't know, the Fujiwara clan was a real family during the Heian period. And if that name rings a bell, that means you're on the right track. The Heian period is when Sukuna was the king of curses over 1000 years ago. Tengen is the advocate of Buddhism in Jujutsu Kaisen. His age of sorcery is also from around 1200 years ago. Even our main antagonist, Kenjaku, comes from the same time period. Which means this clan existed during that time of the golden age of sorcery, whom Kenjaku is trying to revive in the modern world. So there must be some connection between Fujiwara, Tengen and Sukuna. This all is very important because until now, we only have seen Gojo mention the ventral spirit, Sugawara no Michizane from that period. And this character is said to be the ancestor to both Satoru Gojo and Yuta. Moreover, according to our own world history, the Fujiwara and the Sugawara families were in conflict. In fact, the Fujiwara family indirectly caused the death of Sugawara no Michizane. In our history, Fujiwara no Tokihira accused Sugawara of a royal conspiracy and then the ruler stripped Sugawara's position sending him out to exile where he died. So knowing that Yuta and Gojo's ancestor was in direct conflict with the Fujiwara, why did Takako ask if Yuta was a Fujiwara? Well obviously she doesn't know exactly where this boy is from and there's quite an interesting story here. Yes, Akutomi is pretty bold steep because the Fujiwara in history dominated the Japanese politics of the Heian period through the monopoly of the region position. The family's primary strategy to be in power was marrying the daughters to emperors. It sounds a lot like what the current Jujutsu society is, with the big free clan wanting to have the most power by hook or crook, even something like killing their own blood. Which means there could be a possibility that the Fujiwara did actually marry one of their own daughters to the enemy clan to make some sort of treaty but that didn't work out. However, that mingling that led to Yuta being born in the future. And guess what? Takako was a former assassin captain of a squad that was affiliated with the group Do. Remember how Gojo was targeted by multiple assassins back when he was a child? Well, judging from how the politics between families are, it wouldn't be a surprise if Uro might have actually been linked with one of the Jujutsu clans in the present timeline. She might have mistaken Yuta for a Fujiwara or sensed a resemblance. But what we can say for sure is that Uro Takako just gave a very important link to the past Jujutsu world. Either way, Uro now annoyed at Yuta's way of thinking, she initiates the attack and gets into a heated battle where right after they are attacked by Ryu. And what can you call this attack? My man shooting a laser beam from his pompadour. Like gosh dang man, up to me, where do you come up with this stuff? But this brings us to chapter 177 where the first thing we see is Octomi making a Neon Genesis reference and a pun at the same time because Ryu is refusing a sweet death. The Jojo-like character then decides to go on a rant about his previous life to Yuta. In the previous chapter, Ryu was clearly looking very excited to have a fight against Yuta in order to satisfy some sort of hunger. Yeah, I guess it's just a normal day with all these wild analogies from Octomi that's gonna define a character. But seriously, Ryu literally wants Yuta to be his dessert. Wait, 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 hold up, listen, listen, I actually understand what he means, it's not that sus, okay? What he's trying to say is that Yuta being so strong with a bottomless energy will be able to satisfy his hunger plus more. He wants the challenge and to be pushed to his limits. All his life, Ryu encountered mediocrity, even though he used to eat, enjoy, fight and meet women but all in moderation. It wasn't a life that he regretted but it wasn't a life that he could be happy about either. Even then he was annoyed with his life and people around him kept asking, what's wrong with you? What more could you want from your life? My man's sounding pretty greedy and ungrateful but we all been there right? Where this this emptiness in our hearts, you know, feeling like something's missing. What? Oh wait, maybe that's just me. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but seriously guys, for reals, in Leo's perspective, he might have had everything, but it was all monotonous and boring. Like an everyday meal of rice. There was nothing unpredictable or exciting about it at all, making him feel like he was missing the dessert. Even smoking a cigarette for him long enough tasted sweet. He felt that he deserved a dessert in his life similar to the taste of cigarettes after effect. And so, Yuta was fitting to be the dessert of his life he had been looking for. This monologue kind of showcases how Ryo is somewhat like the opposite of Nanami's desire for monotony and normalcy. But coming back to the fight, it's like Ryo is in some futuristic shampoo commercial because he can fire cannons which he called granite blast from his hair. Like for reals, what's up with all of these hair powers? Where's Remy, Hanyu, Haba? Come on man, all of them have powers concentrated in their hair. Even then, Ryu is clearly in a different league because his cursed energy blasts are super destructive and even Yuta seems to be struggling with it. Yuta noted in this chapter that Ryu has an insanely high output of cursed energy and he needs to keep his guard up against the explosive amount of energy in every attack. Ryu definitely seems to be at least a grade 1 level sorcerer with such a high output of cursed energy but his overall effectiveness depends on his range of attacks. But talking about grades, Ryu also gave an interesting analogy for Yuta's power in this chapter by stating that attacking Yuta is like knocking on an enormous water tank. He was so impressed by the total amount of cursed energy that Yuta has, which he very well should be because it's more than freaking Satoru Gojo, but he's also impressed with Yuta's toughness. But this toughness is most possibly due to how well Yuta is using his cursed energy enhancement and reinforcement, since as we know Yuji noticed it too. But continuing forwards, whilst both Yuta and Ryu were analysing each other, Ryu threw in some heavy blows and Yuta had to guard himself to not take any major damage. Suddenly Ryu throws Yuta and fires off another granite blast in frustration of his previous unfulfilling life. He was never satisfied with the kind of life he led and he felt that if life was a meal, he would never be full. But this is Yuta we're talking about. Instead of flinching, our boy goes in straight up and uses his bare hands to block another granite blast that Ryu used at close range. It's insane, he even got so close to Ryu that he nearly ended up busting Ryu's face in. Unfortunately though, Ryu's cannon sent him flying for Yuta to then get tagged but Udo who just pulled a one up on him and interrupted the fight. She distorted the space around Yuta and attacked him with a blast called Thin Ice Missile. These attacks one after another sends our boy Yuta in another direction. He literally tanking everything. But unfortunately Unfortunately, you know, you know, Ryo doesn't really like this interference and he gets pissed off and shoots his cannon beam right into this woman's face. But she completely counters him by doing some spinneroo distorting space and sends his attack back right at him. Ryu floored by eating his own attack actually states that this was the first time this ever happened to him. But despite their interaction, Yuta stands up firm after all of the damage he has taken. And at this point, Ryo states that even though reverse curse energy is very hard to deal with, after all that damage Yuta has been dealing with, fight after fight, being hit with massive attacks from Kuroshi, Udo and then himself, he can finally see the end of Yuta's seemingly bottomless cursed energy. In Ryu's perspective, even though Yuta is a special grade sorcerer, he still has limits and constantly using reverse curse technique is pretty draining and every fight Yuta has fought until now damaged him. Moreover, Yuta has been relentlessly fighting in the Sendai colony for 3 days straight. It makes complete sense that he's exhausted with all of the fighting on his own. And this thought actually depresses Ryu and he seems quite disappointed with the fact that Yuta wouldn't be the one to test his limits and push him further, further past the mediocrity that he lived through. He gives another stupid analogy as he states no matter how delicious or expensive the cake shop is, the empty shelves at closing times will always be a disappointment. <laughs> what is this guy on about? Whilst he's in his sad and sorrows, our guy Yuta over here is actually doing some big brain calculations. My guy's not in his limits, he doesn't have limits. We're talking about Yuta. These old generation scrub curse users need to put respect on our boy's name. After brawling with these two has-beens, Yuta comes to the conclusion that Ryo won't target ordinary civilians, but he also won't hesitate to get them involved. And considering Udo's points, she only fights sorcerers because of her pride. But the point is, Yuta wanted to protect everyone 
at the stadium. He wanted to save the civilians. Remember our boy is a hero. Not the hero we deserve, but the one we need. However, now he doesn't have a choice. He just has to go all out. Yes guys, all this time, we were just seeing Yuta at his base state. Yuta now stating the same commands he said back in his fight against Ghetto in Volume 0. This time with much more confidence, Yuta exclaims, Come Rika, all of you. <laughs> And I can't lie, it's pretty intense when Octomy states all of her shall emerge. And if you guys noticed, this is one of the first times since Yuta's return that we are seeing the ring his childhood lover Rika Orimoto gave him. And if some of you guys forgot, this ring is what held down Rika's soul in this world as a cursed spirit and kept her from passing away. However, we all believe that after Volume 0, Rika was set free, but somewhere down the line, Rika probably refused and said, Nah, man, you're my I want to stay with you. Then that's it. I don't know why, but Rika did not go away. She's not passed on and she is here to stay. And the big point was that Rika was what made Yuta broken in the first place. So after all of his training, he must have some incredible control over her and her power. So far, he only had Rika out to protect the civilians, but it seems now he's gonna use her power for reals this time. But again, what does it mean about all of you? Had he been only using part of Rika's power and now he's going to unleash all of it? Like who knows? The limit is literally unreal. At any rate, the look in Yuta's eyes seems so cold. Hopefully, we'll see Rika in action this time rather than going off screen like in Volume 0. Next chapter 178 will delve more into Rika's power. But guys, next week we are dropping a video explaining Yuta and Rika in full detail, breaking down how strong they are. So make sure you guys have the notification bell ding so you don't miss out. And of course, watch this video on Yuta's backstory. Otherwise, you're probably going to be a bit confused. 